Let us pray. Mm -hmm. O oh God, who have accomplished the work of human redemption through the paschal mystery of your only begotten Son, graciously grant that we, who confidently proclaim under sacramental signs the death and resurrection of Christ, may experience continued increase of your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. So the little uh, prelude piece we're listening to there uh, is probably familiar to many, unless a grain of wheat by Sister Bernadette Farrell, a Benedictine, um, and we would have also listened if I had jumped on a sooner. Uh, let all mortal flesh keep silence, which is a considerably older uh, pit piece from about oh, 1,600 years or so ago. Um, and that's also one that we have in many of our Catholic hymnals. And they put that together to sort of draw out that we have great pieces composed in 1970 and great pieces composed in 470, and we use them all in the liturgy. Um, the prayer that we just heard is taken from the votive mass for the Most Holy Eucharist. So if a priest was wanting to do a mass, on any particular day as a votive or special offering for the Most Holy Eucharist, he could turn to that section of the Roman Missal and use that as the opening prayer or collect. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that much. Um, so last month, um, your pastor talked about some four areas of the Eucharist. So who was here for that? Was anybody here? Who, who was here for that? Most folks? Okay. Um, I don't think that this is absolutely background, um, so we'll, I'll, I'll touch back to a couple of pieces of it a few times that um, if you weren't here, don't worry, hopefully the rest of it is really understandable. He pointed out the, the, the Jewish roots of our celebration of the Eucharist. He pointed out the scriptural basis of our celebration of the Eucharist, went through a number of theological developments that help us to understand the Eucharist more fully, and the, those same theological developments that also impacted the way in which we celebrate the Eucharist and then closed with a number of key concepts, some of which I'll revisit, the majority of which um, I won't, but do feel free to raise them um, in questions as we're going through. What I'm gonna try and move us towards is what um, a theology department would call eucology, the structure of prayer, studying how prayers are written. It sounds like it belongs on the medical campus, it doesn't, it's the study of how we give thanks, eucology. Um, a lot of what I'm drawing is coming from uh, Father Jeremy Driscoll's What Happens at Mass. Um, it's a great book. If you want a really good introduction um, to, to read through over several weeks of What Happens at Mass, an explanation of each of the parts of the celebration each time that we gather, um, you can take a look at that. And he opens us up with this quote, something happens at Mass. God is acting. He acts to save us. It is a huge event. In fact, there is nothing bigger. God has concentrated the entirety of his saving love for the world into the ritual action and words of the Eucharistic liturgy. The whole of salvation history, everything God has ever done, concentrates right there <coughs> into the Eucharist that we celebrate, that is given to us, and that we are sent out into the world to be in the world. Before we dive into uh, particular details of the Eucharistic prayer and the liturgy of the Eucharist, I wanted to back up or sort of you know, zoom out in the Venn diagram sense of the category of thing that we're talking about here. We're talking about liturgy. Liturgy is a Greek word that means the, uh, the work of the people. Um, one of the ways that, that has been understood is it's a public work. People come together, they do something, and they offer a work. That is fine, but it's a kind of impoverished understanding of what liturgy means from a Christian sense. What liturgy means as the work of the people is, is that we are the people who have become Christ. And so the liturgy is always the action of Christ in and through us. So we participate in God's saving action of Christ by allowing ourselves to be gathered together as the people. So you can almost think of it as the work of a person, the one, God in Jesus, who is acting in and through us. An image that uh, has often been used throughout the history of the church is, is that we become like an instrument. We become a flute that is played by God, which is something that's not unique to the Christian tradition as well, or either. Uh, we are the piano that's being played by the hands of God, and we are, the, we are our best when we empty ourselves and allow that divine rhythm to be uh, fully resonated out. A couple of key concepts uh, for us to keep in mind here 
that will bounce back and forth. I just wanted to make sure we have these as some background. That there's a, a phrase that's often used in liturgical studies called lex orandi, lex credendi. Um, literally translated, it means the law of prayer, the law of belief. What this says is, is that the, what we believe as a church is preceded by what we pray. I think we often sit down and think that somehow Jesus handed us a catechism and that we church then sat down and decided how we were going to celebrate that catechism or had to figure out, okay, now what do we do? Okay, let's do liturgy. Uh, it's quite the opposite. In fact, it's in liturgy that the church is born. Our liturgy precedes us, and the church is birthed from the celebration of the liturgy. So if we want to understand what we believe, the first place we have to go is what we pray. Uh, and I would say that about anything. If you want to know what the church preaches and teaches about marriage, go to a Catholic wedding. If they ask you as you're coming in, bride side or grooms, just say, I don't know, priests or gods or something, <laughs> go. There are always public events. The same thing about funerals. I mean, it's, it may seem kind of creepy to go to somebody's funeral. It's actually probably better to go to a Catholic funeral of somebody you don't know if you're going to be paying attention to what the liturgical structure is and what's being celebrated. Um, so certainly, you know, anytime you're wondering, well, what does the church teach about X, go to a celebration of that. Um, we have our movement throughout the liturgical year that uh, unfolds various different pieces of what the church teaches. This is why the catechumen at the RCIA is also structured around the church year. The belief of the church is that the syllabus of being Christian is unfolded throughout the church year. Um, and as we move through those different feasts, we come to an understanding of what the church believes because of how we pray. So if that's true, how we pray really should matter. Because if we pray wrongly or badly, then we get bad theology out of it. If we don't understand what we're playing with here, um, if we don't, as um, Annie Gillard said, wear crash helmets and flak jackets when we go to liturgy, then we're kind of missing the point of who we're entering into. So to keep this, this sense of the lex orandi, the lex credendi, what we pray, structures, what we believe. And a lot of contemporary theologians since about the 1940s, I know it's a strange definition of contemporary, but as we go through this, you'll see that a really strange sense of history. Um, a lot of contemporary theologians have really added to that the lex vivendi, the law of living. That if the liturgy is going to do any work at all, the work that it ultimately does is to transform us. Uh, so that it is not just about transforming bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, but it's about transforming us also into the body of Christ. So that we can be sent into the world and be eleven to transform the rest of the world into the body and blood of Christ as well. Um, and I'm not making this stuff up, you can read the book on it as well. Um, so a couple of, of things to, to help us you know, to sort of get a sense of where we are in the Mass. Um, we know that in general we divide the Mass into two parts, the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. The current way that we actually divide it is four parts, the introductory rites, the Liturgy of the Word, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, and the concluding rites. When you do that, that two-part division or that four-part division, you end up with a problem. You have the profession of faith or the creed and the prayer of the faithful or the bidding prayers or the universal prayer, has a dozen petitions, lots of names for it. Those two elements kind of dangle in the middle and we don't know what to do with them. Do they belong to the Liturgy of the Word or do they belong to the Liturgy of the Eucharist? There's a more ancient way that we divided the Liturgy of the Eucharist, the Mass, into two parts. It was the mass of the catechumens that was everything from the beginning up until the missio or dismissal or mass of the catechumens. And then everything that we started with the profession of faith, the prayer of the faithful, and went all the way up to the dismissal of the faithful. And so you get the mass of the faithful. So the mass of the catechumens and the mass of the faithful. It holds everything together. It makes a lot more sense out of it. You probably won't hear this uh, much used anymore, but I think it does help us to situate what we're talking about. So the, the Mass of the Faithful, the Liturgy of the Eucharist, is something for the people who are already baptized. The celebration of the Liturgy of the Eucharist is not about teaching the faith. It's about celebrating what we have already been initiated into and continually being reincorporated into it. We always precede the Liturgy of the Eucharist by the Liturgy of the Word. God's action comes first. Um, and so we'll see how this becomes an important thing as we try and figure out what is this thing that we're doing as liturgy of the um, as we go further? So there's the profession of faith, the creed, the prayer of the faithful, and then there's these two parts that are the auxiliary rites that immediately precede uh, the, the, the Eucharistic prayer proper. 
There's the preparation of the gifts, which some people will call the offertory. Don't let me catch you calling it the offertory. Uh, <laughs> and there's the prayer over the offerings. Um, these two things do kind of dangle in the middle. They're like the opening hymn would be to the Mass of the Catechumens. They're not really part of the liturgy. They're before the priest says, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. But it's very much part of the Mass. It's an important thing that's being done there. Um, so these preparation of the gifts and the prayer over the offerings prepare us for what is about to happen in the Eucharistic prayer. So I've got a little bit of a picture montage here of uh, what is happening when we do the preparation of the gifts. Um, all of creation participates in this. Uh, what we usually see is somebody carrying up a nice basket that has some things that marginally resemble bread in it and carrying up a basket that has wine in it. Um, we don't necessarily connect that back to all of the things that it took to get it there. Um, so just sort of briefly in this montage, we have that it's the gift of the earth, there's land, there's sun, there's rain that's involved in this, and it's the work of human hands. Somebody's got to bake that bread. Um, bread is a hugely cultural item. It doesn't happen by accident. Somebody's got to do a lot of work to make it happen. And in fact, that's true of other grains. It just happens that Christianity emerged in the ancient Near East, and so bread fits with that. It's something that's quite ancient. This little statue on the left is in Cologne, and it dates from something like four and a half thousand years ago. This is somebody pounding out grain to turn it into bread. Um, it's something that makes good use of technology. We're not saying that we should be Amish. You can have things out there that help you to drill in your seeds a lot better so that you can grow more bread. Uh, all of creation participates in this, and it necessitates a care for justice. Uh, what we do and what we celebrate when we come together necessitates a care for the earth, necessitates a care for the land. If we just think that we can celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist and not care about the land and not care about the water, then we're fooling ourselves. We're going to end up with disgusting tasting wine, bad terroir, and we're going to end up with the inability to be able to produce these things. Uh, if we don't care about the justice issues, this is why I've got a stamp of Cesar Chavez right there. Um, if we don't care about the justice issues of the folks who are harvesting our grapes and growing our grain, um, then we're not celebrating the Eucharist correctly. All of these elements come in when we are celebrating the liturgy of the Eucharist and are part of this presentation of the gifts that we're doing. Um, that element of the presentation of the gifts is a highly abbreviated celebration in the current rite. Uh, bread is placed on a back table, wine is placed on a back table, we pass a money basket around, we throw some money in there, and that's all brought up to the, to the table. In the earliest centuries of the celebration of the Liturgy of the Eucharist, there would have been a special space within the church, or even a separate building. Uh, if you go to, the, uh, to Pisa, there's three buildings on the plain in Pisa there, it's the same in Florence and elsewhere. There's three buildings there. There's the Duomo, the cathedral, the church. There's the baptistry, where those preparing for baptism were instructed and then eventually baptized. And there's that other building, the one in Pisa that's leaning a little bit. Um, that little building was something of the administration complex of the church. But its main liturgical function is this, is this is where you would bring your stuff. If you were a farmer or a baker or a wine presser or an oil maker or a carpenter, you'd bring something from your fruits that you had produced during the week. You would bring it to that space and you'd put it there. And then when it came time for the preparation of the gifts, the deacons would go out and they would choose the choicest pieces of bread and the choicest collections of wine. They would bring those up, those would be consecrated, everyone would share in them. And at the end of the Mass, when the deacon, the same ones, says, go in peace to glorify the Lord by your life, you'd be broken up into squads, you'd go back over that big collection there, and you guys would go to the women's shelter, taking some food that had been dropped off there. You guys would go down to the docks, and you guys would go over to the hospital, each under the direction of the deacon, taking some of these things that had been brought there. And so in this way, what we bring forward, some of it is consecrated, becoming the body and blood of Christ, but all of it is put at the service of the church, being sent out into the world. So this is all happening before we even get to the Eucharistic prayer itself. Um, so now we know where we are in the liturgy. We know all sorts of things that happened before it. We know where we are in the cosmos. We know various different things that happened that enabled us to be in this place where we can celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist. Anytime we're reading anything in the life of the church, it's extremely helpful to ask, first and foremost, what is it? What genre is it? Um, if you've ever taken a scripture study class or if you've ever done a Bible study um, here or at your home parishes, one of the first things that you've done is form criticism. Even if you didn't 
know it as that label. 